Matt from South Carolina. All right. Okay. Yep. Good crew we got here. Great. Where'd Jasmine go? We get it going? <clears throat> Whoops. Let me mute this over here. Okay. Yep. Good crew we got here. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us again for a second round of uh, free run. We had so much fun last week. We thought we would uh, do it again. Um, we had some great questions on YouTube and in our DMs, which is super helpful and want to make sure we can get to all those. So please keep those coming. And we're going to try to get to as many of those as possible during the conversation. But we also leave time at the end for incorporating them into any that we couldn't cover. So um, for all those, for anybody that wasn't here last week, I'm Sabato Sigaria, and with me uh, is Dustin Wilson, um, fellow master sommelier from Verve Wine. Uh, we've got Mike Laszlo of Laszlo Law out of Boulder, Colorado. And with this pandemic in impacting literally every aspect of our industry, we thought it would be good to bring on some guests who can start to offer their perspectives on different facets of the industry uh, and the challenges that they're facing and how they're strategizing uh, and preparing for what that new normal is. I think as we go through this, the more that we can understand how this is impacting everyone, the more we can help support each other uh, in the food, wine, uh, hospitality community and how we can move forward on that. Um, so for the next 45 minutes, we're gonna be uh, talking about state of food and beverage, uh, the food and beverage industry, um, what we've learned about the CARES Act, uh, also how restaurants are, are thinking about applying it and what their options are. Um, but first, we're thrilled to be joined by our good friend, Jasmine Hirsch. Uh, Jasmine is the GM of Hirsch Vineyards in Sonoma Coast. And um, with our world so intimately tied to the wine world, uh, we wanted to check in with Jasmine and get her perspective on the uh, current state of affairs of winemakers and grape growers and all that other good stuff. So Dustin, I'll throw it to you. Sure, uh, welcome everybody. Great to be back. Thanks, Sabato, for the intro. Uh, Jasmine, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we'll just kind of dive right into this here. Uh, wineries and vineyards. Um, obviously, you guys are being impacted by all this just as much as the rest of us, um, especially with restaurants being closed down. You know, the trickle down is to, to the importers and distributors, then down to you guys and, and the vineyard growers. Um, tell us a little bit about what the top concerns are for you right now. You're in a unique position where you have a vineyard and you're also making wine and selling wine. Um, what are the top things that are impacting you at the moment? I imagine cash flow, um, you know, labor is, is going to be a factor, but maybe let's, let's start with, uh, with that and see, um, you know, where things are with you right now. So for us specifically at Hirsch, um, we are both a winery and a grower. Um, our biggest concern, like with, with uh, many businesses right now, is cash flow. And uh, we've seen sales fall off a cliff. Um, we are you know, highly uh, integrated with the restaurant industry. And with the closure of, of restaurants, uh, we've, those sales have just disappeared. Uh, many of our distributors are smaller distributors that focus on the on-premise space. Um, they're really struggling. Um, and what you're seeing overall in the wine industry, um, both at the winery level and at the distributor level, is this pivot uh, to try to take advantage of different channels. Um, so we at Hirsch, you know, we sell wine through wholesalers who then sell predominantly our wines to restaurants, but also to fine independent retail. Uh, the restaurants, of course, are closed right now. Um, so our distributors and, and us as wineries, we're trying to pivot to, to, to sell more at retail. Um, those wineries that have always been um, very focused on retail or on grocery sales uh, have actually seen sales go up. Uh, I wanna emphasize this data is all anecdotal. There has not been any um, time yet for uh, the institutions in our industry um, to collect good data, but uh, those that focus on the, on the, on, on the off-premise space, excuse me, uh, are actually doing okay right now. Um, and then, of course, we also have um, a portion of our business that's coming from sales uh, direct to consumer, uh, which can be divided between tasting room and, uh, and then essentially, let's call this second bucket, online sales. Um, just like everybody else um, that have you know, public spaces, we've had to close our tasting rooms in the wine industry. Um, it, across the fine wine uh, industry, it represents about 30% of winery sales, tasting room sales. Uh, and that is business, those are sales that wineries will never see again. I mean, that's just business that's that's gone. 
So um, the other side of, of our business, uh, direct consumer businesses is uh, online sales, whether through a mailing list, a wine club, um, website. Uh, those sales seem to be up. Um, anecdotally, people's spring releases seem to be doing very well. Uh, we at Hirsch, we sell wine to our mailing list um, pretty much exclusively via allocations. Um, so what we've done is uh, with so many people staying home, uh, we have um, received so many requests, you know, hey, you know, we didn't buy during the spring, we want some wine while we're home. So we've, we're, we're trying to make that channel shift as well and move away from, you know, temporarily away from the allocation model uh, to try to sell, um, you know, direct to people with a more open model. Um, but really what you're seeing is this sort of massive channel shift across the whole industry to try to, you um, to have some cash coming in to support uh, our business operations. And, and just to kind of um, to clarify for people that might not know the difference. So buying Hearst wines from me, for example, on vervewine.com is not the same as buying Hearst wines directly from you. Uh, because we, I, as a retailer, even though you're buying the wine online, I fall into the wholesale bucket or channel, not necessarily the DTC channel. So, you know, I think what might be it for any of the consumers that are that are watching right now, how can they uh, best help uh, the wineries that they love right now? So um, buying from a retailer like Verve is a 100% fantastic way to support wineries that you love. If you can also buy direct from the winery, in other words, if you love Hirsch, if you love you know, cruise wine, whomever, whatever wine may be your favorite, you can go online, join their mailing list and ask them to ship to you directly. Um, but the fine independent retailers are so crucial to wineries like us as well um, and have always been supporters of us. So both are great. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of restaurants are trying to raise a little bit of money by selling their off the wines from their wine list. Um, this is another great way to get wine at home to drink and to give some money to your local restaurant. And often it's a great way to get wines that you might not otherwise be able to, to get access to. So I, I, what I would say is continue to, to support the people that you've always supported, reach out to them, ask them how you can support them. Keep drinking. Great. That's the most important yes. thing. <laughs> Keep buying wine. Yeah. Um, now, now continuing down that cash flow conversation. So when we talk about like, uh, you know, bottling what's in the tank, what's in barrel, your various vineyard contracts and things of that nature, um, how are you looking at it uh, at this particular uh, side of things right now? So in terms of expenses, I mean, just like any business, we've got overhead, uh, we've got, um, you know, debt service. Um, a lot of the banks that are prime players in the wine industry have been phenomenal partners to us and are letting us delay uh, our debt payments. Um, overhead, rent, things like that, you know, utilities, wineries use a lot of electricity, um, and then of course payroll. So, um, you know, that's, you know, how can we keep everybody working and employed? And then in terms of things like bottling, I mean, bottling outside of harvest is when most of us spend the most amount of cash because we're buying glass bottles, we're buying corks, we're buying labels, we're buying foils um, in order to put the wines into bottle. Um, Aside to that, you know, bottling often requires people to stand really close together because you're working on a bottling line together. It depends. If, if you're in totally automated, then this might not be a concern for you. But in a small winery like us, you know, our bottling line requires people to stand uh, less than six feet apart. So with the current social distancing rules in place, you know, I don't know how we would bottle. We're not scheduled to bottle until June. Um, but what I have been heard hearing, again, anecdotally, is that people, wineries are pushing off bottling, both from the point of view of how can we do this under current social distancing guidelines? And, you know, I don't really want to spend $100,000 on glass bottles right now. Um, so those are, those are the big, um, you know, expenses and then side concern. And then, of course, with harvest coming, you know, it's, it's April. Um, harvest is not that far away. And, uh, you know, it could start into August and you need to, you know, be preparing. So you might be buying, um, you might be limiting your equipment purchases, but maybe you do need a new pump. Uh, you definitely need to buy supplies that are, you know, going to get used up during harvest and you are uh, bringing on more labor. And then, of course, ultimately, you're going to have to pay for your grape contracts, which are uh, oh, some of our biggest. Jasmine, the bottling question, how far can you actually push that before you start running into issues with harvest in terms of when you need the tanks back and, you know, seller space? Because at some point it's going to it'll get backed up and yeah. you got to put it somewhere. 
So we have at Hirsch um, very limited, you know, um, very limited bo uh, barrel space, barrel storage space. That's re that's a uh, uh, safe for barrels. It's temperature controlled or humidity controlled. I need to bottle about half of my 2019 vintage in order to make space for the 2020 vintage before harvest. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's about 4,000 cases of wine that has to get bottled before harvest. Now I have heard some people have said, you know, we slowed down our line to 50% the normal speed so we could work with fewer people and let them stay farther apart. You know, that has its own issues as well. I mean, both from a cost point of view and a wine quality point of view, you know, you really kind of want to get the wine from barrel into the bottling tank and then through the line and into glass as soon as you can for the safety of the wine. So, you know, there's just a whole nother logistical layer uh, to yeah. that. And then the other thing I would say too is, um, again, uh, anecdotal, but wineries that are do selling a lot of wine right now, you know, they might be at the, we're talking now maybe at the lower end of the market, they might be having huge demand for their wines and they want to put, they want to bottle. And um, one of the things that we've been hearing is concern over supply and supply chain um, integrity. So can I get my glass bottles that typically come from France or China, can I get my foils that my foils come from Spain? Like the business is not going as usual in those places. Um, so there's a real concern around um, supply chain integrity uh, for, for the materials that we need for bottling. Mm -hmm. And Jasmine, you know, you at Hirsch Vineyards, you're also growers, correct? Correct. Not just making wine, but you're also growing grapes. Yeah. As a grower, putting that hat on, What's keeping you up at night right now? So my, well, I can't think about that without thinking about my winery hat on. So we're the wine, Hirsch Winery is the biggest customer for grapes from Hirsch Vineyards, right? We keep about 50 of the 70 producing acres uh, for ourselves. I've seen my sales fall off a cliff of my current vintage wines, right? 2017 vintage is what we're selling right now. And then I've got a, boatload of 2018s in bottle, and then I've got all my 2019s, right? So I'm thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if I could make less wine in 2020? Um, so that does make me wonder, you know, might there be uh, an opportunity to sell more grapes this year? But I'm looking at that same grape market that everybody else is, yeah. um, even if we are on the higher end and we have a named vineyard, but still, I mean, how many people are going to really want to expand their portfolio of high-end Pinot Noirs right now and buy grapes from us. So, you know, we're looking at it the same way that any other winery would look at it. So um, I would say, you know, biggest, we're not, we have such amazing wineries that we partner with that have been buying grapes from us, some of them for over 25 years. Uh, we're not particularly worried about them continuing to buy fruit from us. Um, a lot of our uh, grape sales are based on handshake agreements. Um, it's not, not necessarily written contracts, but we're not particularly worried about that. Uh, we are worried about the health and safety of our vineyard crew. And that has been a huge focus for us since the very beginning of this is making sure that they are getting the same information and they're all Spanish speakers. Are they getting the same information about health, safety, their rights? Um, as any of our English speaking employees. And actually I have to say the local authorities have been very good about getting everything translated into Spanish. And then also Spanish language radio has been absolutely ahead of the game and getting information out there to their listeners. So, um, you know, we just really want to keep everybody safe. So, and we're very lucky that we wineries, um, because the, the, the government looks at wine as a food and that's always how wine has been regulated. We are considered an essential business of course, we still have to close our public spaces and we still have to keep people safe by law and also by, by moral responsibility. Um, but we're lucky that we can keep working um, and that our people can continue to go to work just under slightly different arrangements. As, uh, as a grower, are you worried that the labor, even the availability of labor will be an issue come harvest time? Or uh, are you seeing something now? And, and even with, uh, you mentioned that your contracts are fine or your handshake deals are fine. Have you heard anything in uh, you know, just in and around the marketplace, or are people worried that they won't have uh, that they won't have fruit uh, to, or they'll have fruit, but they won't have anybody to sell it to? That they won't have buyers. Yes, you are starting to hear this. I mean, this was already an issue last year. So pre-COVID nineteen, there was an oversupply of grapes, and uh, fruit was left on the vine. Um, bulk 
wine sellers are having trouble finding buyers. And this was all before this started. You were starting to see, I mean, what, what I've heard from people who watch those markets, you were starting to see that gap close between supply and demand. But now with what's happening, I mean, it's just going to widen again. Um, so, you know, I don't have any specific examples that I can give you, but you are starting to, you know, growers are concerned. Let's put it that way. Yeah. No. Yeah. And in regards to labor, um, the, um, all of our field workers come as seasonal workers to the U.S. under H-2A visa programs. The H-2 visas are for seasonal workers. It could be, you know, people coming to work for the summer at a resort or, you know, a hotel um, or coming to pick uh, vegetables or coming to pick grapes. The timber industry uses these visas. The U.S. Um, uh, government has actually, I want to get this language right, they have designated the H-2 visa program as a mission critical category um, because they recognize the importance of H-2 workers. Finally, uh, we're rec recognizing our immigrant labor as essential to keeping the food supply secure in this country. Um, so when the U.S. consulate in Tijuana closed, a lot of people, we, our workers were already here for the year. They, they leave and they come back. That's part of the program. Our workers had already arrived for Hirsch, but a lot of people had not had their H2 workers arrive. Um, and so what the consulate has done is they've switched, um, they're basically granting in-person uh, interview waivers. So they're saying, you know, your workers don't actually have to physically come to the consulate because the consulate's closed, right? Um, for the safety of their workers. So the government is helping on this. I don't know how quickly they're moving ahead with granting the visas so that they can get here in time for the critical, you know, vegetable fruit and, and ultimately grape harvest. And Jasmine, you had touched a little bit on, um, on different channels and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop something up on the screen that, uh, that you had shared with us earlier. And um, here we go, so you should be able to see this. Um, but when you start looking at, uh, when you start looking at how a winery can pivot. Um, why don't you tell us kind of what we're looking at, but then what are some other creative ways that wineries are trying to, to shift their, their income stream? Yeah, so this chart is um, a product of Silicon Valley Bank, who is one of the foremost lenders to the fine wine industry. Um, and they put this together based on an extensive survey that they do every year. So this is from 2019. Um, and this shows the channel mix. In other words, um, where are our dollars, our sales coming from in the wine industry? So you can see that close to 30% of sales um, for, and I just want to emphasize, this is Silicon Valley Bank clients and survey responders. So this is going to skew towards the fine wine side of the business, but they have thousands of, of winery clients. So it's, it's one of the best sources of information at the high end of our industry. So 30% of sales come from tasting rooms. That is a zero right now. Uh, all tasting rooms are closed. And as I said before, those are sales that wineries are not going to be able to recapture because those guests, you know, just like with a restaurant, they're never going to come through the door in, you know, on April 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that opportunity is lost. Um, there is a um, interesting uh, rumbling that I've been hearing around, um, you know, as stay, stay at home orders start to be lifted and people feel a little bit safer going out, they're not going to want to get on an airplane, right? But they might want to take a little staycation. Um, they might want to go do something fun that they can do by car. So for wineries that have, you know, I mean, look, the, 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 the wineries that are close to New York City, when things start to get better, you know, people might want to hop in their car and get out of New York, get out of New Jersey and, and go visit some of the local wineries. So there is this, um, uh, you know, looking ahead when we are able to reopen our taste rooms, you know, local business is going to be really, really key because I think people are outside of California going to be staying home. Um, or if they, you know, if they can't drive a wine club and mailing list, you know, this is online, right? So these are sales that you can um, continue to make. Um, we are still able to ship wine, which is huge. Um, and really what you're seeing is that wineries that, um, you know, are trying to make up some of that lost tasting room revenue through, um, through the, the, the mailing list and, and wine club channels. On the wholesale side, so now wholesale would be the distributors that we were talking about earlier, and then you know not shown here um, within wholesale, you've got that breakdown between restaurants, grocery, wine, independent wine sh wine uh, shops like Verve. Um, so you don't you're not really seeing that breakdown in there. And so where a winery falls in terms of 
where their wines get sold by wholesalers can be having a huge impact on whether or not they're continuing to sell wine through that wholesale channel. So, you know, Hirsch is about 70% with, with, with our wine that goes to wholesale, 70% goes to restaurants. And obviously, you know, that business is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, export is an interesting one. I mean, here it's only 3%. It is 25% of my wholesale business. And, um, you know, obviously the COVID-19 crisis has affected different countries differently. And it's, the timeline for countries is different. So our importer in Singapore, for example, fully still plans to pick up his annual order of wine. Mm -hmm. Our importer in Italy is not. So, you know, we, we are seeing different markets, um, you know, giving us a different indication of whether they might buy, when they might buy. Um, and so having a diversity of channel mix as well as a geographic uh, diversity is really helpful right now. And there's a lot of wineries though, especially at the high end that don't have that, that are maybe really dependent on tourism in Napa or Sonoma uh, or really dependent on restaurant. And I think um, it's probably the same that it is in the restaurant side of things where right now, whatever business plan you had or business model, it's great. I hope I wrote that in pencil because you're gonna be updating with the latest information that's coming out, whether it's in terms of what you can open, what the uh, social distancing requirements are, just to keep your employees and your guests safe. So I think it's being able to, what, what your channel mix might be today, might be different a month from now, but really thinking about all the options with it. Um, Absolutely. So, awesome. We're definitely rewriting our business plans on a, we're, we're, we're aiming to look at it every two weeks, which is mm -hmm. insane. Normally you write your plan and you kind of put it to bed and you maybe look at it quarterly. Um, so we're looking at cash flow every two weeks, sales projections every two weeks, um, accounts receivable, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, every day. <laughs> we're a little nervous on that side. Um, but one thing I will say, silver lining here is we are trying new things as us as individual, individual winery. We're trying to sell wine in new ways. We're trying to connect with our customers in new ways. And that's partly to sell wine, but also partly because just like everybody else, we're craving that human connection and we love our customers. And so actually being able to you know, have a longer conversation with them because we're not as busy. I, I'm not traveling. So um, we're, we're trying new things. And I'm very curious to see and very um, invested in uh, holding on to some of these new practices that we're developing for post COVID-19. Um, not only will we be entering a different world, potentially with a long-term recession ahead of us and, and changes in price points and changes in the restaurant industry, but there are opportunities to learn new things and to question all of the ways that we've sold and, and even maybe produced wine in the past. Great. Um. Let's see, uh, what else? Um, in terms of innovation, as you kind of look at this, um, in terms of what opportunities that, you know, anytime there's adversity, there's always a chance to innovate. When you look at this um, and you were to think big and you're able to rebuild this when we come out of it, what are some of the innovations that might come out of this? Um, you know, so it's not just the doom and gloom, but hey, we have a chance to start from scratch in some sense. What are those things on the top of your list? You know, I, I have to say, I don't, because we're growers and for us everything comes back to the land and to 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 um you know we live there it's our home it's uh really the core of who we are we don't start from scratch we never start from scratch because we always start with the land and and the and the and just from a pure financial point of view the cost of taking care of it and you know we're biodynamic the cost of looking at it through a biodynamic lens um, and, and all the associated costs with that, those, those don't go away. I mean, if I didn't have, if I wasn't tied to one vineyard, I mean, I think what this would teach me is to pivot to being less of a traditional fine winery and more of a um, more, it, let's say more open with more diversity of price points. I mean, most of my wine's pretty expensive. Right. I wish I had more diversity of price points right now. I wish I had wines that I was comfortable selling in grocery stores. Right. I mean, I we all shop at grocery. What's what's wrong with selling wine at grocery? Right. Um, and if I had a little bit more, if I was a little bit more nimble on my cost side, but because we're tied to this vineyard um, and happily so, we don't have as much flexibility to pivot. And this is why I think growers are really worried about contracts. 
they ultimately, and it's always this way, if there's a bad vintage, you know who ends up holding the cost is the grower. Mm -hmm. And so it's always, unfortunately, I think it always trickles back to the grower that they're the ones that will be paying some of the highest costs mm -hmm. in the wine industry as a result of this, this crisis, because they don't have the flexibility to pivot. They're, grow they're farmers, they're landowners, so. And I think when, when it does that, come to, uh, oh, I was just gonna say one, th one thing that you mentioned earlier that I think uh, is one of those silver linings too, is if the government can realize the importance of um, uh, migrant labor, uh, immigrants in, in the keeping things moving forward um, with it, uh, because that's something that's vital to your world. It's vital to the restaurant world. And there's sort of the unsung heroes as you look at who's still harvesting, keeping the food supply going, um, wow. et cetera. So. We were shocked to learn, and it's it's still unclear, uh, under the CARES Act, I know you guys have been talking a lot about the PPP loans. Um, we were shocked to learn that, that agricultural enterprises are probably not eligible for PPP loans, which we were shocked to learn. Um, we're not, it's not entirely clear. We still plan to apply for one, but um, it was uh, very surprising to me that that they were deliberately excluded and, and that the USDA is supposed to be helping but hasn't done really anything as best as we understand. Um, so there's a, a, a lot of problems with the PPP um, program, especially for restaurants, um, but also strange to see that ag was excluded. Jasmine, there's uh, a couple questions regarding tasting rooms and I, I think you might, I don't know if you're sticking around, but I wanna make sure I ask you that now. Um, just so we get to that and get your input on that. Um, and I'll try to combine them. What uh, are you, with the uncertainty, do you have an idea of when you might open, reopen tasting rooms? Um, certainly, of course, government would have to allow you to do that. Um, it, but what that reopen would look like? Do you have any, uh, are you thinking about that now? Yes, thinking about it because of this staycation idea that that a lot of the if if Napa and Sonoma see tourism this year, it's going to be local. It's going to be people that can come by car. Um, so how do we connect with with those folks and make sure that they know that we're open? Uh, we have a very small tasting room. We are um, look. We were trying to grow that business, but at this moment, we're lucky that that wasn't. I mean, it's not thirty percent of my business. Um, it's closer to about ten. Um, our tasting room is very small. And uh, we've always offered a mix of private and public tastings. Uh, I think uh, what we'll probably do, you know, until people feel 100% safe uh, gathering with other people, we'll probably move to all private tastings. And uh, we would like to reopen as soon as the government allows us to. Uh, and also look towards what kinds of programming, what kinds of um, exciting things could we put in place um, for people when they are ready to return. Uh, a lot of people that we've been talking to, customers, I mean, private customers, you know, they just want, they want to go to restaurants. They want to open wine and drink wine with their friends again. They want to come to wine country. You know, people are, there's going to be this pent up demand for people to, to connect with other people in person. And so, you know, for us, it's as soon as we can. And, and of course, I have to also say, as soon as my team feels safe, yeah. even before the shelter in place and, and even before the government required us to close our tasting room, we closed our tasting room because my team didn't feel safe. Um, you know, they don't want to sit across the table from somebody, you know, not knowing if, if they might potentially, even unbeknownst to the guest, sure. be sick. So um, there's a lot of, we have to go through as a, as a country and, and as individual regions a lot before people are gonna feel safe uh, for these kinds of interactions. Agreed. So that's, go ahead. No, I was just say thank you, Jasmine. I think awesome thank to you. hear your perspective and, um, and understand what's going on in, in your world because we're all in this together in one way or another. So um, please keep us posted on on what's going on there. Um, I'm sure there'll be some more questions coming in uh, on YouTube and also through our channels and we'll try and get answers to those. But uh, we're cheering you on and uh, we're gonna do our part to keep on on drinking. So that, that won't be uh, at the fault of any of the, the three of us. So no, thanks thank so much. You. Thanks you guys, thank you for having me. And I just wanna say one last thing. You know, I was talking with the Wine Institute um, to prepare for this call and try to bring some more data to you and your listeners. And, um, the, they said something really important. When, when this is, as this progresses, the wine industry needs to figure out and wants to figure out how we can support restaurants and how we can help restaurants. 
number one, we cannot survive as businesses without restaurants. But number two, it has always been this incredibly wonderful symbiotic relationship between, between food and wine, right? Between restaurants and wineries. So um, I am very interested to, to hear how we can support, whether it's through the Independent Restaurant Coalition or any other way um, and, and in real ways as this all evolves. So uh, the, the wine industry will, be, will need to hear from the restaurant industry how we can help mm -hmm. and uh, uh, yeah. And so anyways, thanks for having me, you guys. And uh, good luck to everyone out there. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jasmine. So Mike, um, last week, uh, the CARES Act was thrown out to small businesses. And it was kind of like the start of the amazing race where it's like, here, here's it is now understand it and what it can apply to you. Um, so can you bring us up to speed on what happened on Friday? And there were a lot of changes and some confusion. So um, what happened there? Well, a lot of a lot happened and a lot of nothing happened. Uh, it, Friday was uh, was a rough day, probably for just about everybody listening that was thinking about uh, trying to participate in these PP loans um, or actually did try. Uh, one of the big issues was there was a ton of confusion with what these loans were actually going to look like on Thursday night. Um, you know, the program was going to go live, if, if, if you will, on, you know, midnight on Friday. So, you know, us in the Rocky Mountain area, we are looking for that 10 o'clock deadline or 10, 10 o'clock PM start time. And right at that time, we were still getting new information about the application was going to change. Chase Bank, I think at that point had said, we're not even taking applications. So don't, you know, don't even try the site. Wells Fargo hadn't come online. Most banks had not come online. And in fact, we learned at midnight that that actually uh, was true. So a lot of frustration. Um, the interest rate uh, changed from 0.5% over two years to 1%, uh, where you know we understand that that was uh, to make the loans a little bit more enticing to the lenders. Uh, then we get to Friday morning and there's a mad rush on the banks. And what we understand was that really only the community banks were set up or willing, not, and I take that back, not only the community banks, but from a large extent, only the community banks were really ready to, to sit down take those applications, maybe even in person, whereas the big banks weren't. So a ton of confusion. Uh, my, my day Friday was all dealing with this. Um, and what we, as the weekend progressed and even up to today, the it seems like over the weekend, the bigger banks had come online. Uh, people who tried to submit had some success with varying degrees. And then we're up to today where I just hear a couple about an hour ago that Wells Fargo said, okay, we're done. We've taken all the applications that we're going to take. Uh, and that's a, uh, insane to me that Wells Fargo did that. I'm very disappointed in them. Um, they opened up the applications on Saturday, took them through Sunday night and Sunday night said, we're done. We're not lending any more through this program. So I, I don't know how that's going to work, frankly. And if the rest of the banks, if the, the big banks do that, I think that's going to be a serious problem. Um, I'd be interested to hearing from the people listening, you know, what their experiences were. Uh, I, I doubt they were great, um, but I'm, I'm, I am hearing that there's been some confirmation of, of applications accepted, but again, very little information on when the application is going to go through and when you might actually see some of this money. So the questions continue. And then there's going to be bigger picture questions of what is the payback and forgiveness, uh, forgiveness calculation look like? We don't have those answers and frankly, nobody does. Uh, so that's very confusing right now, but for anybody even considering getting one of these loans, get your application in as soon as you can. Talk to your banker, and I'd go right to your bank, because a lot of these banks have also said, we're only lending to people who have been with us, have an account with us, and we even heard from U.S. Bank that you have to have our mobile app, which U.S. Bank's just terrible, and that mobile app is impossible to get. So. Uh, you know, every hurdle you can get through. I would say call a local bank, a community bank, get on the phone with somebody right now and see if they can, they can handle your application. Um, it's, it's been a rough. So Mike, uh, something that came up last week uh, during some conversations with other restaurant industry professionals was the, uh, the idea of loan origination date and yeah. what that actually means. Um, and there seems to be a little confusion of, that that term might be able to shift and change in some way or another. What's your take on that? Well, you know, the loan origination date, I expect it to be when the loan is funded. Uh, that's traditionally, in my experience, when it when it originates, when it's funded, um, when that money is available to you. As opposed to so as opposed to what some people are saying is maybe 
perhaps when I start to draw on that. Yeah, I'm going to get there. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that to me, it, and it depends. I mean, if, if, if you have an account and all of a sudden you have $100,000 from the PPP loan in your account, whether you use it or not, I would say that's, you've got the money. Not like a line of credit where it might say, hey, you have $100,000 available to you. Your first draw would, would maybe start that clock. I, I don't think this is going to be a, a line of credit type deal. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's, you're going to have an account and the loan is going to go right in there. And I think once it's in there, it's hard to argue that that's not the loan origination date. Now, my understanding is that uh, maybe perhaps the part of the next round of uh, rules, regulations, or clarifications would be that they'll perhaps there'd be some ability to move that date. Because right now, uh, you know, if, if we have to use it within eight weeks, you know, there's a good chance we're never we're not even going to be open. I mean, if we're a restaurant, right. there's a good chance we're just going to be burning any opportunity we have to use any of those funds to have staff help us restart our restaurant. Um, and we might just pay, be paying idle hands at that point. So um, there, I have no answer to that question, but I do know that that is a very hot question. Um, and I do know that the, uh, the lobby arms and Congress are looking at that. Well, I don't know. I don't have personal knowledge of that. I'm, I'm told that that's going on. So I, I hope, I really do hope that we see an extension of timeline in which the loan can be used, not just this eight week period, and that there is a, a clarification on when when the clock starts running. I think that's gonna have to happen. I mean, it, these clocks, the legislation went in on the 27th and you know, a couple of days later, we're told to extend social, I'm sorry, to extend stay at home enclosures through April 30th. So right there was another two weeks we didn't bargain for. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that that will just by necessity be extended. Yeah, we have a lot of confused restaurant uh, folks who, you know, are, are a little skeptical about bringing on these loans and bringing staff back on and paying for them while the restaurant is still closed, not knowing when they can reopen. So that's, that's yeah, that's the problem topic. because you are going to, yeah. I mean, unless you have tasks that, that these folks, folks can do from home, you really are just paying them to sit, sit at home. And, and that's not, right. I mean, that's not good for anybody. That's just not, that's not the, the right mentality. Um, and I think what I'm, what I'm understanding, what I'm hearing from clients is that they don't want to do that. They, the, the employees don't want that. They might rather just stay on employment and, and not have that and wait uh, and not come on. So I, I don't, yeah. I don't think that's, that's very workable. If you're going to do that, you know, I might be with management team that's working on new business plans and strategies to see if, if you can even get the restaurant back open and then what it would look like. That's what I'd be using that money for if I was bringing back employees. Is this it or and, is, uh, there, is there more future stimulus that's coming? I, I expect there will be, that there will be more. I think we all expect that. This, this in my opinion, and I think uh, it, it reads this way, was let's get the engine started and then we're going to have another plan for long term. Uh, the problem is we don't, you know, we don't know what long term looks like. How can we build a plan around it? I mean, I, I don't know that the PPP is going to work for m most of my restaurant clients, certainly the ones that are absolutely closed, doing no takeout, no delivery. I, I don't I don't know how they take this money, only use 25 percent of it for non payroll costs and actually make that work. And I, I those are those are the issues that are just so difficult to answer right now. You're going to say something, Dustin? Yeah, just kind of circling back to the uh, to the banks, um, you know, and Mike, in your opinion, you may or may not have the answer to this. What what do you think are the big reasons why you're seeing um, certain banks not taking any more applications? Is it a pure volume thing? Um, is it lack of funds thing? Is it because the loans aren't attractive enough as attractive enough to them as a lender? Uh, what's your what's your opinion there? My best guess, and I'm not a banker, I'm not in the banking industry, but my best guess would be that. Uh, with some of the lenders, there's only so much available to each lending to each lending institution. And so once they've reached that point, they're, they're going to tap out and say, okay, we've got, you know, 5,000 applications for 200 million or I, I, you know, whatever the math would be. And they just, you know, by function of necessity, they're not able to take any more applications. You know, I, my understanding with Wells Fargo is that they're claiming that they were only allowed to loan up to 10 billion or something. I, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that would be an explanation. It seems to me that massive institutions like Wells Fargo would not be limited to such a small piece of the $350 billion pie. But again, maybe it's true. So I, I think the idea that these loans are not attractive enough to the banks probably is not, probably is not the actual answer at this point. I, I also saw, saw different banks saying, 
any profit we would make on these loans, we're going to donate it to, you know, relief funds. And, and so that to me would, would suggest profit's not the motive here, which is hard for everyone to believe, of course, but uh, it, it seems like that's not at least the public facing speaking point of the banks. So I, I think the other point is confusion. You're used to it lending on extreme information and a ton, you know, every, anybody who's gone for a loan knows, I mean, it's like proctology exam. I mean, you are, you are being vetted and it's, it's, to, for these banks now to go through a two page application is really like a page and a half. Again, I, it was more, it was much more difficult for me to get an apartment in college with like cash in hand than it, it was to apply for it, from what I'm seeing to apply for these loans. I mean, it's, it's like a nothing. It's you put in some numbers and hand it in. Um, it's so I think the banks are just concerned that it's too easy, but I think so the government, tried to make it that easy. They want, they want, I do believe the government wants the small business to have this money. And, and Mike, um, you touched about this, like one of the first calls to your banker, second to your landlord. So shifting to, to that side of the, of the coin, um, obviously rent payment is one of the most important um, yeah. uh, bills that we have to pay. Um, when you're working with your clients, what sort of creative options have you started to come up with or see or, or start to ponder? Well, this is an interesting thing and something I want to ask you about, Sav, actually, is that uh, the first thing is this. What we've noticed uh, since we talked last, so last week, so, uh, you know, what came and went between, before the la uh, since the last episode was April 1st. Everybody's rent was due, you know, four days ago, five days ago. And I'd say to a large extent, I haven't, uh, you know, we paid our rent, but I think a lot of people did not pay their rent and understandably so. So what we've seen in the meantime, and I was reviewing letters from landlords this weekend, um, we've seen landlords try to jump out and say, here's a plan, you know, we'll give you this option, uh, you know, defer, excuse me, defer rent for three months for perhaps and tack it in, tack it on starting in August. Um, but in exchange for us agreeing to do that, we need to see proof that you have submitted a PPP application and submitted a business interruption claim. I don't think we're gonna have time for today, but the business interruption side of things is just a nightmare right now. Um, you can pretty much assume you'll be denied, right or wrong, you can pretty much assume that. So we've actually had landlords come in and say, hey, look, we want to kind of be a part of your business decision making for cash flow over the next couple of months. That to me is, it's, I understand it. It's a, you know, a, a business trying to make sure that they're going to get paid and have a space for you to continue operations in. But with the amount of information we don't have, I mean, it's very hard for tenants living on no cash flow to make these to make these uh, these agreements, and and so that's I want to ask you about is you know as a restaurateur and you know dealing with one unit or multiple units when you have uh, the prospect of having three months of rent deferred, for instance, over top of no cash flow. I mean, I mean I know what I advise as a lawyer what your rights are, but I mean from a business perspective, how are you analyzing that? Well, I think it's it's as you said, there's so much uncertainty out there. One of the challenges is. What is the economy that I'm going to be opening up in when this is over? So great, I could prolong my payments until you know August, but what if in August I'm at 50% capacity? Like that's what by law I'm only allowed to operate at 50% yeah. capacity. You can't really write your your business uh, model according to that. Um, you know, and I think the priorities have sort of shifted. You know, when the first week everyone was taking care of their employees and setting them up for success the best they could in that environment. But now it gets to the point where um, we're saying, oh, shoot, I want to make sure that there's a business for them to come back to when it's all said and done. So it's like, I need to put my oxygen mask on first for the business, and then let's start to, to look at that. So, you know, I was just playing around doing some, um, doing some modeling of the leases. And I think leases are probably the first place that I would look to start to set up from favorable terms. Um, just like before you plan on opening your restaurant, you have to secure your lease. So just a little uh, exercise here, if I can find it on my computer. Yep, I think there it is. Um, now I just have to say, this is uh, made up numbers um, that are uh, fictitious. I'm not a CFO, I'm not a CPA. Um, and- You kind of look like one though. Yeah, I, I play one on TV sometimes. Um, so as you, you look at this, um, I sort of put together a, a fictitious restaurant that would, um, based on 2019, let's just say they did 5 million in sales and their overall occupancy was 
uh, and then they brought 10% to the bottom line. So that's sort of what we're starting with on this. And you can see, um, whoops, let me see if I can make that bigger. Can you see the far right on this or not? Um, it's cut off a little bit, so. Okay, so there, at the end of the year, 5 million, you paid 500,000 in rent, and then uh, you had 500,000 to the bottom line. Great. Now, if you look at what happens if you didn't get rent relief during this time, so this is assuming um, the 2019s at the top, at the bottom here, you have no rent relief, and then you um, have reduced sales, there's a ramp up back to normal, and this is generous, 50% in June, and then 50% July, 75% on from there, um, that you've just lost 125,000 in this situation, um, and just on the rent side of things, and when you look at that profitability, assuming everything ramps back up, you're at 2.2%. So you just went from making 500,000 last year to 62,000 this year. And now keep in mind, this is assuming that every other cost flexes um, with, the, with the sales levels, which is absolutely impossible to do. Um, you're still paying, you know, in this March, April, May, you're still paying some staff on there. There's other utilities, there's other bills that are piling up. So in essence, you've just dissolved that. Um, and so if you did get the, uh, you know, the, the permission to sort of slide it over to even just next year, um, and that's what this last one shows, um, is that, okay, uh, I'm able to slide, I'm able to take these three months, I didn't pay any rent here. And then as this ramps up here, you can see, okay, great, I got back up to 7%, which, whew, that's a little more manageable to some extent. But then when you start having to layer that into next year, this little sum right here, those three months spread out uh, over the course of the entire year, again, that erodes it. And that's assuming solely that we've just gone through a whole year. It takes one year and then we're back to normal. I have a hard time believing that, but that's just showing that that's a, that's a pretty big struggle there. And the uncertainty of what that ramp up is going to be. I saw somebody asking about that, uh, one of the questions. That's one of the biggest questions that we have. Um, of what that will be. And that's what's limited by the government, what's um, uh, for safety reasons, um, what consumers are gonna be uh, their state of mind, also um, what the economy is going to help support. So there's a lot of unknowns and to commit to a, uh, a rent right now um, in a lease is really challenging. I think if I was to, to prioritize what one of the biggest uh, best case scenarios would be, would be going to do some sort of percentage rent. And that's something where you're transparent with your landlord and some restaurants are already on this, but to say, hey, for the foreseeable future, maybe it's for the next year, we're gonna do a percentage rent or we'd like to do a percentage rent so that we can, uh, as our business ramps up, you get more until we can get to that point where you're kept whole to where we were before, but we're all in this together. Whether people can take you up on that or not, I'm not sure, but I do think um, knowing that it's not just restaurants, but it's every single industry that is impacted that there's actually probably more leverage in the restaurateur's hands right now than there is in um, saying, hey, I'm gonna turn back the keys and now go find another tenant because I'm not sure there's gonna be a lot. Yeah, and I think, you know, so that's an interesting point. You know, I think the tenants have more leverage than a lot of them believe that they do. Uh, the landlords need tenants just as much as tenants need a landlord. Um, so I, I, I think the opportunity for creative solutions almost in a partnership type way is, is what you need mm -hmm. to be looking at here. I mean, and I think with that, they'll be able to, there'll be hopefully some empathy from landlords if, you know, if, if that exists um, and that they can actually see and understand what the margins are in restaurants, how you're doing, not like, Oh, there's people just spilling out on the streets every night. Well, yes. But when you look at the margins um, and everything, how it flows through, it's not as uh, glamorous as, as they may be led to believe, but I think if you can make it a win-win, and this is another uh, reason to have good relationships with landlords and, yeah. and do that from the beginning, so. And one thing I, I didn't get to mention uh, about leases earlier though, I mean, this is a good time to be looking at your, your options in the lease uh, as you go into these potential negotiations, because, you know, as I'm looking at them, if we have, you know, if our lease is up December 31st, and we're not, we don't, we might not even open until maybe August, are we looking at just not reopening under the, under the current lease and saying to the landlord, hey, I'm out, you know, I'm out, I'm going to exit. Because, you know, if I do it now, it's, it's, more, it's more in line with, you know, frustration of purpose or maybe even, you know, impossibility of performance uh, under, the, land, under the, the lease because, you know, we're not going to be open and we don't know what it's going to look like and I've only got six months left. So maybe I just try to exit now. But if I reopen, 
I think, you know, I've opened that can of worms. So uh, that's one point I wanted to make earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think you were gonna say something, Dustin? Yeah, I was just uh, kind of alluding to that, that same point. Um, when it comes to the options that restaurateurs may have, whether to reopen or not reopen, given what's going on here, whether it's the leases or the amount of costs, you know, how should restaurateurs be looking at this, um, depending maybe where they are in their own life cycle of the restaurant? Yeah, I think it's important to do an entire rebudgeting exercise. And as Jasmine was saying, we're rebudgeting on, on, on the regular now. And I think doing that for the next um, uh, next three years, I'd probably say, and is even though that's a big, a um, lot of unknowns built into that, if you're taking out a loan and you're looking at that payback of two years, what's the impact of that going to be, the interest payment on the overall profitability of it? Um, when you're rebudgeting, um, you know, trying to figure out the volume and, and really taking a, a line by line analysis of every single expense you have. And um, is it a nice to have, a need to have? What can you renegotiate? Um, are there things that you need to reinvest in? Things like marketing um, as you come out of this to tell your story, to let people know you're open. Um, and then, you know, layering in what type of uh, revenue uh, that you're getting from the CARES Act and then say, okay, with my business model, what has to pivot and take a look at that. But I think that's what's going to tell you, um, you know, about the reopening side of things. Now, another thing that's interesting too is we're talking about, okay, how do we get, get open? But if you're that restaurant that only has a year or two, maybe even three years left on your lease, there also might be some considerations of saying, okay, is this the time for me to step back and, and, and close? Just because if I'm looking at the unknowns of, of uh, you know, this year, probably going to lose money this year, maybe next year, if I'm lucky, I get back up to normal. And then there's actually serious costs about closing. You know, if you have to return the space to the original condition, um, you know, uh, you're still paying bills for the, the 30 or 60 days um, leading up to that. Um, there's a lot of cash outflow that happens when you close. So you really have to weigh that into there um, and, and see. But that could also be a great time for you to have a conversation with your landlord that says, hey, it's not really in my best interest to open, um, knowing we have two years left on the lease. Can we renegotiate something, whether it's for another two years, three years, five years, just to make sure that you can help make it sustainable for you and your teams uh, in that time? And I think that's where you do have that upper hand and it's not just, oh, it's all gloom and doom. Well, maybe you can't actually create something that will help set you up for even longer term success. Mm -hmm. All right, Dustin, were you gonna say something? No, oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Sabato, on that point, is there a conversation you're having or is an analysis you're doing right now to say, are we even going to reopen at all? Are we just gonna shut down for good? Yeah, I think that's where it's coming up with a, very, a number of different um, budgeting opportunity or budgeting scenarios of uh, sales, business model, can you find another way to um, another revenue stream? Are you opening for another meal period? Are you doing takeout? Um, you know, for me, it's, and then also prioritizing when you're bringing people on, who you're bringing them on. Um, and I think that's what's really important too, is if you can use this CARES Act to, to start to build your quarantine cabinet, if you will, of the people that are going to really help um, help you strategize and then put the strategy into implementation. That's money well spent right now so that you can really be laying all the options out and they can start to get a head, uh, head start on, uh, on what their tasks uh, are. It's almost like a little task force. So I think that's where I would be investing it right now um, to really explore every single option um, at my disposal. Yeah, I think a, ser a, a really scary question would, would, or a scary scenario for me would be that the government says, okay, you can reopen, but at 50% capacity. I, I mean, how, right. I mean, boy, that would just be almost impossible. I, could, yeah. I couldn't imagine having to make that work. And restaurants aren't profitable at 50%, which is why it's, you know, having those conversations with the landlord, I think it needs to be an open-ended conversation yeah. as you learn more, uh, because you could be agreeing to an amazing um, lease term by the standards of what it was like uh, in February of 2020. This is an amazing lease deal. But yeah. then when you come out the other end of it and realize, wow, I'm not going to be able to get to full capacity till the end of the year by state mandate, then yeah. there you're back at the table again. So I think it's being able to, to put out some various options and have a dialogue um, with it. It's not just going to be done one letter across the table, check yes or no. I think there really has to be a dialogue um, with the landlords because 
maybe they're gonna be getting some support as well. Maybe there's additional support coming to restaurants and how you can use that to minimize the impact on, on both parties. Yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about last week as well is, you know, this is all what the restaurant can do and what the government's gonna allow us to do. Just what about the, the psyche of the consumer? You know, are we all going to go back to restaurants on in September or when the cold weather hits again, if this virus comes back, uh, you know, it's got to go away first. But if it comes back, you know, just how do you plan for that? I mean, and that to me is when you're talking to your investors or just looking at your spreadsheets and saying, mm -hmm. does it make sense to open? And if mm -hmm. it doesn't, let's start exiting some of these contracts that we can mm -hmm. and and doing our best to uh, to move on and find a different business to be in or a, a new, you know, a new restaurant somewhere mm -hmm. else. These are all questions that uh, I think should be asked. Yeah. There's also the additional costs of actually reopening as well. So yeah. if you're restocking uh, all of your food that's obviously gone to waste over this course of time uh, for those restaurants that have been selling wine uh, to go, you know, re replenishing your, your wine inventory, your spirits inventory, your beer inventory. Um, those are all pretty heavy costs that you may have to think about, um, you know, are you going to need to retrain your staff? Are you going to need to have a few days of people being back on the payroll, going through the motions, figuring out maybe a new menu or a new setup at your restaurant? These are all things that are going to cost a lot more money. And, and currently, you know, the paycheck thing is nice and it might be a way to get some people paid, but that's not necessarily the capital that some of these restaurants are going to need to physically reopen their doors. Yeah. And that's where I'm optimistic that there will be some restaurant and industry specific um, uh, stimulus that happens, whether it's on the state level, whether it's on the federal level. Um, I think we will see that. And, you know, from the restaurant standpoint, I would prioritize right now. Um, the two things would be if you could get uh, the some help with standardizing how we proceed with the rent or some reimbursement of the rent, not just for the time we're closed, but the unforeseen ramp up with it. Um, I think business interruption, um, if there was a way to help support in that. Um, there's a lot of ifs and buts and, and, and unknowns with that, but that would be at the top of the list that I'd be looking for. Um, that would be, I think, have the most impact um, to that, so. Yeah, I think chatting chatting through as much as you can with your, uh, with your landlord and figuring that piece of the puzzle out, and then maybe the next piece after that is going to be modeling out what your restaurant looks like when we when you do reopen. That's you know, well. expect maybe only fifty percent capacity. That's assuming you know even if the the government allows everyone to come back out, that doesn't mean that your restaurant is going to be just as busy as it was before. So you kind of have to build your financial model to look at the next three, six, nine, twelve months of you know that arc of getting back to where you were. Uh, and Rob Idner brought up a, a good point here on the on the chat saying that um, looking at there's cost and cash flow. Yes, what are the costs, but what is gonna be the cash outlay and what kind of cash you have coming right. in? Because that without cash is king in this situation to both jumpstart, but then keep the momentum going and fund it until you can actually start to gain some, some traction uh, and back to uh, stable ground. So good point. Yep. Yeah, it's all gonna flow up. I mean, that's the deal the, the landlords, you know, not, some of them are the enemy, but I, you can't, I don't think it's smart to be looking at them as the enemy at this point. I think you need to be looking at them and they should be looking at you as a business partner because, you know, some of these leases are, most of them are multi-million dollar leases over the course of the, the term, 10 years or more with options. And the landlord wants that money and you need a space to operate in. So I, I think, you know, taking that approach to the landlord saying, look, we just need to come up with a, uh, you know, plan that works for for us long term and the us being the landlord and tenant, mm -hmm. that's one of your best bargaining chips. I, I really believe that. It's, that's how you get a win-win. Yeah. When, when the restaurant wins, the landlord wins. Um, and I think that's something that they can be more vested in, in the supporting of the, the business. Yeah. Yeah. The bank, really looking at it as a team, as a team. Yeah. And the bankers need to be involved probably at some point too, because the bankers finance, you know, are, are on the mortgage that the landlords need to pay. And so they're, you know, they collect money so they can give it to the bank every month for the mortgage. And there's going to, you know, I, I know in Ohio, uh, Governor DeWine tried or has strongly requested, I think was the term, uh, that commercial landlords um, do not seek eviction within 90 days and then they do not seek rent in 90 days. Um, you know, evictions are going to be something very interesting now because the courts are most, most state court clo are closed for evictions at this point, um, based on what I've seen, certainly in Ohio they are, here in Colorado, it's very difficult to, to get anything going in the, in the court system. So, 
you, again, you go to the, the landlord and you say, look, what are you going to really try to evict me right now? Or over the next even 120 days, mm-hmm. let's figure this out. Let's work out a plan. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to be frankly, respectful. It's- I want to be respectful oh. of everyone's uh, quarantine time and people That's have to get back to their, their normal Monday quarantine routine. So Dustin, you want to take a couple questions and then uh, bring us home? Yeah, let's do it. Let's see what we have going on here. Um, so Jackson Lane, he says, I believe you're seeing a transition of power from landlords to operators need to tread carefully, uh, but the opportunity will be significant for the strongest operators. So yeah, it kind of touches right on what we were talking about. I think you do need to be a little careful there though with how you approach that and not come on too strong. You know, I think to Mike's point, um, you know, looking at them as a, as a partner, as a teammate, uh, not an enemy in any way, whether you feel like you're on top of the game or not, um, I think is gonna be really important through this time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't see them wanting to kick many people out. Even after this is over, um, they're gonna need the cash probably just as much as, as anyone else will. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see what else we have here. Is it faster to focus on a stimulus package for real estate and landlords before restaurants gain, uh, gain the aid and attention we need? Mike, Let's what do you think? Uh, you know, well, I, I think there's a couple of different ways to look at that question. One would be legislative and, you know, we don't have, I, I think if you're a lobby group, if you're making a push for any type of state or national type of legislation, I think you're focusing on everything and you're saying, look, the stimulus package for real estate, I'm sorry, for the for small businesses now is great. We also have to look up the chain into um, to landlords and banking institutions that lend to them. I think that absolutely. And I, I kind of think that's what we're seeing through some of these, gov- these governor's orders. Again, just going back to the, uh, Governor DeWine in Ohio, I do believe like that, that kind of plays to that. Under, he, he, him understanding that we need to get the landlords in play here and we need to get their lending institutions in play so that they can not default on their obligations and then have to pass that madness down to the tenant. So I, I do think you need to look at it from all, the government is gonna to have to look at it from all sides, but it's important in my perspective, and I try to tell my clients this, landlords and uh, tenant clients, that this is not, this is unlike anything we've ever seen. You, you're gonna to have to work together unless you just don't wanna get paid. Go ahead and kick somebody out, fine, raise the rent. You know, Do your 3% uptick this year. You're just not gonna have a tenant. Mm-hmm. So do you want to keep some, I mean, do you want to keep somebody up while you punch them or do you want them just to fall? I, I mean, you know, you've got to, you've got to work with everybody mm-hmm. here um, to make it work because let's just be realistic. A lot of these businesses at the retail level, restaurant and otherwise are not going to make it. And, and some of them will choose not to make it. And some of them just won't make it. And those are hard realities. So if I'm a landlord, I'm saying, what can I do mm-hmm. to make it as enticing to you and as, as workable to you so that I have a tenant for the next 10 years? This is going to take a long time. And so I, Mike, uh, Rob Bittner here asked a really good question. The option of bankruptcy. Okay. I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. So uh, that's the number one thing. Um, but there are some provisions. In this the is something we act. haven't talked about yet. No, and it's yeah. bankruptcy is scary territory. Um, you know, there are, there are, there are, you should consider it if you're in that position. Um, but you, you have to be so careful because bankruptcy brings in so many different facets uh, of uh, there's different types of bankruptcy. And then you have to keep in mind that maybe even in bankruptcy, there's certain things that might not be forgiven. And so is this actually going to get me to where I want to be? And then of course, once you file bankruptcy, uh, you know, that sticks with you for a while. So, um, and you know, if you're a sole proprietor, fine, you get to make those decisions. But if you, uh, if you have investors who are personal guarantees on loans and they don't want, you know, those investors, don't want the business to declare bankruptcy because it'll screw up everything else they've got going. Um, you know, you've got to consider all that. So if you are in a dire situation where bankruptcy may be an option, uh, I would get on the phone today with, with a bankruptcy attorney and see what my options are. But the CARES Act did provide for ba- uh, some ba- uh, new uh, small business bankruptcy options. Um, so it, it is worth considering if that's where you're, you know, if that's where you may be looking. But it, bankruptcy, uh, right. that's a daunting situation. So I think let's do one more question here, just to kind of close things out. Uh, Mark Craig says, I'm confused as a consumer how to best support local restaurants. Just ordering takeout if available or what else can they do? Sabato, this might be a good one for you. Sure, I think um, there's no one silver bullet to it, um, but I think the what you had mentioned, whether it's ordering takeout when you can, 
um, if it's buying wine, if they're selling it there. But I think the big thing that's going to long term help um, not just one restaurant, but all restaurants is reaching out to the representatives um, and in your state uh, and your, your governor, your mayor, and really letting them understand um, the importance that restaurants have in communities and bringing communities together in part of um, the crucial need for them when uh, we do emerge from this and how we can have ensure that those businesses are there. Um, I think they're starting to learn that the stimulus they put out there, it's not for every single industry. So, you know, letting them know the challenges with rent, um, uh, the challenges with business interruption, um, and that the restaurants need help. Um, I think that would be what I would say on behalf of almost every restaurant tour out there, that, that, that those calls, those letters um, are what's gonna really help make long-term change for this. But continue what you're doing on that front, but take, take 10 minutes to draft up a letter and you can send it to five different people. Yeah, and, and Sabato, where could somebody um, find that information to if they did want to reach out? Oh, you're just going to put me on the spot like that, aren't you? Um, <laughs> what we Google, can find my representative. And I actually did. It was pretty easy. Uh, there it and is. Click on there. there. Is. <laughs> and, then, um, and then it shows, uh, you click on, you know, do you want someone in the house, the Senate? And it tells you their uh, phone number. It tells you their email address. And you just drop in that form letter uh, that you use for all of them. And... Um, I think it's pretty easy. So, yeah, real yep, quick. That's great. Yeah. No. Just, I'm sorry. We just got one question. I just want to touch on it real quick about, uh, you know, is this an opportunity with mergers in this industry? And there was a great article in winebusiness.com this morning. And I would just suggest that you go there again, winebusiness.com. And it was just right about, right about that is mergers and acquisitions in this industry. So uh, very topical. Mm -hmm. So, great. but yeah, thanks guys. Okay. Do you want to take anything else? Is that it? I think, I think that's, it for today. that's it. That's a good uh, time cue right now. About an hour. All right. A little over an hour. Just, just over an hour. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. And thanks to everybody that showed up today. Really appreciate it. Hope this was valuable to you all. Um, and if you could do us a big, big, big favor, uh, please share this with your friends. We are going to archive this on our channel uh, here on YouTube. So you can watch it at any time, forward it along to anybody that would like to check it out. Uh, they will be able to view it indefinitely. Um, Big thing that you can really help us with as well is uh, subscribing. So please subscribe to this channel. Give us a thumbs up on this particular video. Uh, those little things go a really, really long way into uh, helping us grow this thing and uh, expose it to more and more people. So uh, thank you all so much and uh, we'll see you next time. Keep the Thanks questions so coming. We got some great ones uh, in our emails and uh, Instagram and Facebook and on here. So please keep those questions coming to us and we'll try and incorporate those uh, and keep the dialogue going. So my, it, just so everybody knows, my email is on my website and feel free to ever, you know, DM or send me an email and we'll try to incorporate those questions uh, or just feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm, this is a tough time here to help. Great. All right, guys. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>